Well, good morning. It is a full house here today. Welcome to the balcony. Great to see you up there. And for those of you who are watching online, we're live from downtown, almost downtown Glendora. And whether you're in Missoula, Montana, or Miami, Florida, or Monrovia, and you just couldn't get out of bed, we're glad you're here with us this morning. Hey, how many of you are kids, and it's a pretty exciting time. You're out of school, you are a kid, and you can be a kid at heart. Raise your hand. Where are the kids? Yeah, yeah look at that. And uh, hey, we're always thinking about this phrase around Christmas, it is more blessed to give than receive. You didn't talk to a 10-year-old like this one when he was 10, and I was waiting. <laughs> We're going to hold on. We're going to hold on to that. We're going to hold on to that. Hang on to that video because it'll be coming soon. But the bottom line is, we're all about gifts, are we not? We're about the gifts. I know you want to give them to mom and dad, but we kind of want to receive them. I was 10. I had been good all year. I had been asking for a guitar. I wanted to play the guitar in the worst way. And of course, I didn't actually see any guitar wrapped under the tree. I had been looking for the right shape uh, box, and then that Christmas morning, I saw it. It looked like it would be a guitar, but I couldn't exactly tell. They open every other gift, 942 to be exact. <laughs> I am the youngest, and I'm waiting and waiting and my mom says, oh, I guess we're done. I, no more gifts. And I'm looking at this guitar-shaped box, and I'm going, are you sure? She goes, oh, yeah, one more. So she brings it out. I open it up, and sure enough, there's a guitar case. I am like, yes. I open the guitar case, and it's full of socks and underwear. <laughs> and I knew enough to be grateful for socks and underwear. My little 10-year-old lip is quivering, and then from behind me, my dad comes in strumming the guitar. <laughs> it was an awesome prank to be continued in the Irwin family for generations and generations. Oh yeah, I did it to my son as well. <laughs> so our text this morning surprises us about Jesus' birth. It was anything but conventional. We looked at Luke 2 last week. We're going to do a reprise. And instead of looking at this from the angel's perspective, we're going to look from the shepherd's perspective. But if you were tasked with bringing an announcement who was to someone else who's going to release the story, to, to give the press conference, who would you have broken the story to? If you were going to write it, how would you let the world know? How would you have responded if you had been the shepherds? Let's take a review in this video. We'll start with Mary and Joseph, and we'll see how did the shepherds handle this. Let's take a look. An angel came to see Mary. She was doing laundry, and then the angel just appeared, and she was really scared. So Gabriel was like, Mary, you're going to have what? Good. Barry, you're gonna have a baby. I, you're gonna have a baby, and you will call him Jesus. And then Mary was like, I'm not gonna have a baby yet. I'm only a teenager. I'm not married. Then the angel Gabriel told Joseph that Mary is not lying. She, you are having a baby. And so they met up. They went to Bethlehem. Him, which was Joseph's old town. They ride a donkey. <laughs> I don't know. A camel. Oh, yeah, a camel. She said, this donkey's fast. Well, they tried to go to a hotel, and they asked the keeper um, for a place to stay. The keeper said, we have no rooms. Literally, no rooms. <laughs> so Mary and Joseph walked away sadly, but then he said, the only place and here in Bethlehem, here in that, that you can stay, st 
stay is a staple, and then he just pointed the way and they followed. When the shepherds were taking care of the sheep, then they saw angels. The angels said, a new baby is getting born, who is king of the Jews. The angel was singing. And then the shepherd said, I think we should go there and meet him. The second, I think, said, yeah, I agree with you. And the other said, yeah, me too. They had to walk through a bunch of grass and bushes, maybe have to camp out a night. <laughs> All right. Well, that's one rendition. Let's see what Luke 2 says. And I'll reprise from last week. Turn to Luke chapter 2, and I'll read it for you. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And in the King James Version, it says, they were sore afraid. And the angel said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The reading of our scripture today. Now, let's jump into it. What are the facts? Get your notes out. Let's look at the presence of the shepherds. Now, there's a negative view and a positive view of who the shepherds were. How many of you have grown up hearing that the shepherds are kind of the low caste and that was a lowly job and kind of a eh, kind of a job? Well, that's one view, and in fact, the shepherds were probably those handpicked who are raising the sheep that are ultimately going to be uh, slaughtered on the Day of Atonement and all the festivals. And so, one view is they are the lowliest, most despised social group. In fact, in Egypt, they had to watch their flocks outside the city. Secondly, this view is lent because of their work kept them away from the synagogue so they couldn't be ceremonial cleansed and they couldn't get to church on Sundays, quote, unquote. And so they missed all the festivals. And in fact, the Mishnah describes them as thieves. So that's one view, and that's the view that has been popular for decades. I want to give you a little different view of the shepherds. I think this is the positive view. First of all, shepherds are described as church leaders in 1 Peter 5. That's why, pastors, when we mess up, we mess up this analogy big time, all right? And I'm so grateful that we have shepherds on this staff, this, the pastoral staff and ministry team here at Grace Church. Now, I'm going to date myself, but I've been with them for three months, and the gauntlet of ministry that this staff has done for this church and community is un. Believable, And so I think the word shepherd is a positive view. And I want you to thank the shepherds of this church. They're all over in one building at one time. Would you give a round of applause to our staff here at Grace? They are awesome. Very good. Thank you for doing that for them. And this is where I'm going to date myself. They are the Jim Brown of church working staff. Jim Brown, the hardest working man in Hollywood, he's got nothing on these, these folks. Number two, the scripture says, the Lord is my shepherd. That's pretty good credential. I think that's a positive view. Abraham, Moses, David, they're all shepherds. And that's why Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God that was slain. He's the ultimate shepherd and he is the Lamb in that duality. So they're devout men. They're humble men. They're hardworking men. And their work is ultimately going to put them out of business because Jesus, the Lamb of God, will be the ultimate Lamb and the final sacrifice. So, let's conclude. I think there's a duality. Certainly the position of the work was, was dirty and even humbling, but it's necessary. And so the announcement comes to what I would call 
blue-collar guys, not blue bloods like in the elite of Rome. And they represent kind of the common person, the working man of the day. Who would be our common day shepherds? Well, I want to suggest to you, it might be some of those of you who work in jobs that no one sees unless it goes bad. Maybe you're working for the Department of Motor Vehicles or your county flood control worker, like I was when I was 17. It is a thankless job. They hire high school guys going into college to go cut brush up in the San Gabriel Mountains in case of a telephone line goes down, they can get to it. And during that summer, I may have said this already, I ran into eight rattlesnakes during that. I got to be very quick on my feet, especially when I heard that and it was underneath my feet. And so whatever your view of that common blue-collar laborer, that's those guys, and they were honest men. Now, to clarify, they too had to be out in the Judean wilderness, and they're, they're watching the flocks. Now, we see the paralysis of the shepherds. When the angel appears to them, what is their first response? Whoa! In fact, maybe you say it backwards. Whoa! And three of you got that. Thank you. Um, so there's this fear, and it's the third time we have angels, and the third time the initial response is, ah, I'm not so sure about this, right? And so ultimately they're startled because it goes from pitch black, they can see every star in the sky, to this blinding light. Now, I don't know if any of you watched The Chosen at Christmas last night, but I did, and they kind of depicted what that might look like. And so their livelihood demanded that they not fall asleep, that they were protecting the sheep. And so this glory shone around them, and the presence of them, those angels said, this is something big, like bigger than any news that would ever be shared in the world. So the Messiah comes, if you want to write this down, he's coming both as the good shepherd in John 10, and he's the Lamb of God who's going to be sacrificed for the sins of the world in John 1, 29. Good shepherd, John 10, Lamb of God sacrificed in John 1, 29. Now, they thought that it was going to be bad news, because almost always angels come, it's not great news. Joseph had that response, Mary had that response, the shepherds have that response, but their response of fear isn't because that's something negative, it's like, I just don't know. And in fact, when they're confronted with the, the gospel, we're going to see, they're afraid, but they're not skeptical. Some of you here today... Uh, we'll only be here today, and then the next time we'll see you is maybe at Easter, right? And so we're grateful for your, that you're here, because some of you are traveling. You came a long way to be here with your kids or your grandkids, and so this is the place to be on Christmas Eve morning. And maybe you are searching today. At the end of this message, I'm going to give a clear presentation of what it means to have a personal relationship to Jesus Christ. And if you've not yet crossed that line of faith, I pray that you'd consider uh, these words this morning. Now, the proclamation of the shepherds, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And so this announcement has significance for two reasons. The message is good news, good news, because the Messiah is born. Now, again, I've re referenced this a few weeks in a row now. What are they looking for when we say the word Messiah? What kind of Messiah? One that's going to deliver them from the oppression of Rome. But he's coming as the suffering servant, and so this is Messiah, but not exactly the one they were expecting. Secondly, it's significant because it's, the Scripture is the, uh, the city of David, the city of Bethlehem, which was just six miles away. I've been to Israel, I've been to Jerusalem, I've been to Bethlehem. You can walk it. Um, and it was close by. Now, this announcement and how we do it, it happens all different ways. Now, we make a big, big deal about when someone gets pregnant and maybe more so as a boy or a girl and you break the pinata and if blue candy comes out, it's a boy. If it's pink candy, it's a girl. But I remember when we were expecting our firstborn, Katie, that was 39 years ago, and I'm in an elder board meeting 
And my wife at my seat at the table had snuck in and put a little foam something like a phone. Um, it says, please phone home, something like that. I've got exciting news. Now, uh, this was in the 80s, 1984, so I can't easily phone home. I see there's a message taped underneath this phone. So I open the message and it says, surprise, you're going to have a baby. And I announce that and read that in front of the entire elder board. That's how I found out that Cheryl was pregnant. Pretty cool announcement, but we did not have an angelic choir, nor did we have a press conference, all right? Now, the description of Jesus here, these three terms that you're going to see here in this text right there, it's the only time in the New Testament these three words are together, although in the Old Testament they are. What are the three words? Savior, Christ, and the Lord. Savior literally means deliverer from enemies, and there's only two places in the gospel where Christ is referred to as Savior. It's here, and then in John 4, 42, when the men of Sychar, remember the women at the well, uh, confessed him as the Savior of the world. This is significant. This is a big announcement. He's the Christ, a.k.a. the Messiah, and then thirdly, he's the Lord. That's the, the word Adonai. That's the covenant name for God. It's used 37 times uh, as master in relationship to Jesus. So this is an undeniable statement that he's just not a baby, he is God, all right? Now, the pursuit of the shepherds, verses 15 and 16, when the angels had gone away, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When I read that in the King James as a kid, I thought it was Mary, Joseph, and the baby all in one manger. That's a tight fit, you know. Uh, I'm glad they clarified that here. See this thing that has happened. They want to see this. Now, we know there's another group of men, and by the way, shepherds were men. They're, I don't think there were female shepherds, although in our nativity last week, we were equal opportunity employer. We had some female shepherds as well. And I want to thank my friends right here in the second row. Um, I got to be a wise guy. I mean, a wise man last week. And it was so much fun. And I know there's been generations of you who have been a part of that nativity. You got to do it. In fact, I saw Mary and Joseph last week, and now they were singing up here. Uh, it, was, it was pretty awesome, the transformation. Um, but the bottom line is we know that the wise guys show up like two years later, right? They're not part of the nativity, but I can't resist to say that what if the wise men had been wise women? It would be like this. They would have asked for directions. They would have arrived on time. They'd help deliver the baby. They would have cleaned the stable. They would have made a casserole and brought practical gifts like diapers and baby formula. But the bottom line is the shepherds went right away. They found, which means to find after a search. And just like the Magi star had guided them in Matthew, the shepherds had seen the same sign given them by the angel. So they're going to go see if this be true. They have no misgivings. They're not saying if this be true. They're going to go say, let's, let's go prove it. Let's, let's go find out. So they checked around. It's, Bethlehem's not a big city. And that's why when Herod has all the babies killed, under two years of age. It's maybe 150 to 200. That's still a horrible massacre, but it wouldn't take a lot of time to kind of find who just had a baby in a, in a cave, so to speak. And so the shepherds are easily fooled. They're going to verify what they've heard, and they're going to say, hey, God selected us. They must be going, why us? They're just hardworking guys, but they're the first to see Jesus right after he's born. Again, if you are seeking this morning and you have never crossed the line of faith, one of your intellectual obstacles is to get past this question. Is Jesus who he says he is? Is he, as C.S. Lewis said, the Lord? Is he a liar or is he a lunatic? You only really have three choices, and I want to suggest he is the Lord of all creation. And when you see that, and you come to that realization, 
You can't turn away from it. You can't forget what you've discovered or seen. It's a fact. There's a pastor named Pastor Chet who runs a ministry called Patmos. It's a discipleship ministry. And he tells the story of his daughter when she was six years old. They were having a dinner party and dinner guests, and they had all kinds of little finger foods and M&Ms and peanuts and little trays all over the house. And his little daughter grabs the entire bowl of peanut M&Ms and goes and hides in a bedroom, and she is just chowing down. She's like, rah, 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 rah. and she's eating those M&Ms. Well, one of the dinner guests had to make a phone call, so they, he steps in the room, and to his surprise, he sees this little girl with you know, chocolate on her lips and the M&Ms in her hand and just staring him down. And, and so the little girl looks up with full sincerity, no even qualm about it. She said, turn around, mister, and forget what you just saw here. We can't turn around. When we see the claims of Christ, we cannot turn around. We can't dismiss it. We can't deny it. And you have to confront that today if you are looking to cross the line of faith. So when God gets your attention, here's some application. As you look at the shepherds, look at their progression of faith. It starts with dread. Why did an angel visit? This can't be good. To discussion, what in the world just happened to a decision, let's go check it out, to do it now, let's not dilly-dally, and they win immediately. I think we can put all four of those up there. Let's see that progression, all four of those. Dread, discussion, decision, do it now. That, my friends, is similar to how many in this room crossed to the line of faith who gave their lives to Christ because they had to figure all this out, and it, was, it took time. Here's the good news. We have all the time in the world to talk about Jesus, but you don't know when your appointed day is. Now, I'm not here to scare you and talk about car accidents. What I'm saying is, some of you, Jesus has been doing this, and you haven't opened the door of your life to him. Now, many of you made that decision decades ago. I'm guessing most of the grandparents in this room made a decision for Jesus. And that, you're not worried about you. And in many cases, you're not worried about your kids. But you are worried about your grandkids. And so today, kids, adults, students, all of you can make a decision for Christ. And so, the preaching by the shepherds goes like this. And when they made known the statement which had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told by the shepherds. It indicates that they didn't just keep it to themselves. They go and tell people. So this shepherd's experience shows us the process of the Christian life. I'm going to put it up on the screen, one, two, three, and four. First, they hear the revelation of the gospel. Then they believe it, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Then they pursue and embrace Christ. And then they begin to tell others about it, Luke 2, 17. That's what happens when Jesus comes into your life. You want to tell others about it. Some of you are new believers and you can't wait to tell everybody about Jesus. Perish the poor guy who's sitting next to you on a plane if you have the aisle seat, right? He's a captive audience and you got him for three hours to talk about Jesus. Now, here's something also interesting about the shepherds. They're the first hearers of the gospel They're the first believers of the gospel and the first preachers of the gospel. Pretty awesome. And so the bottom line is, if you're a Christian today, are you making Jesus known? Is that part of your experience at Christmas? I know many of you will read this passage again when you open gifts tonight or tomorrow uh, or, or whenever you do. And people might question is this child really the Messiah? And today, I can say with certainty, the Jesus that was born, the Jesus that we celebrate, the Jesus of the nativity, the Jesus that was born to die is who he said he is. And if you have any questions about that, I would love to talk to you all during the next 40 minutes between now and the next service. Kim is here. Uh, the staff are here. We would love to get people in this room. We have elders in the room who would love to talk to you. 
And so our focus, there's really three responses we learn from the shepherds today. Number one, are you fearful of him? Verse 10, the initial response was fear because this implication of an encounter with God, though it might start with fear, ultimately he will be your Lord. And some of us just can't get past these perceptions of who God is and why do bad things happen to good people and what about the Old Testament and all these things. But we need to ultimately, just like the shepherds do, move from fear to faith because the gospel is good news. Secondly, are you curious about him? After your initial shock, they went out and checked it out for themselves. And I believe you should not have a blind faith. For those of you who, who are scientific, who are kind of, and I never remember, who are the scientists? Are you left brain or right brain? The, the, huh? Left brain. Where are my left brain guys and gals? Left brainers. Come on, it's all right to be smart and have an IQ of 4,000. All right. And then some of us are the other one, you know? So the bottom line is these guys are checking it out. They were aware. They're not just content to believe what was said. They checked it out. And you should check it out. And so they report it. They praise him. And I want to make a statement here because, see, they, they were, I don't know when they recognized that Jesus really is the Messiah. Just like the disciples, it took a long time for them to figure that out. Being curious doesn't imply commitment. So don't stop at being curious today. Take that next step, which I'll give you here next. And then thirdly, are you pursuing him? Verse 18. Uh, is there a sense of expectation? Are you buying in? Are you just content to see what others do? Or will you find him? You have that chance this morning. Their journey is our journey. He'll meet you where you're at and desires a relationship. He's worthy of our praise. He demands a response, and we should talk about it. So would you like to know about Jesus today? I think someone might come and pat on the piano here. That's a hint. And I just want to, to talk about the gospel. And it's so important, I put it in your notes so that you can't mistake what I'm about to say. God loves you, and he wants to have a personal relationship with you. And if you don't believe that, look around this room, because that candle we lit is all about his love. Jesus came to save the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The problem is that sin separates us from this loving God. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, and the wages of sin, Romans 6.23, is death. So God sent Jesus, his son, as provision for our sin. And through the incarnation, through the birth as a, uh, as a baby, he was born ultimately to die. It's not enough to just know this. It's not enough to just intellectually believe this. James 2.19 says, hey, you believe there's a God? Well, that's fine. Even the devils believe that there's a God. And so what do we do? Ultimately, this is the, the core message of the gospel. We must individually receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. We're trusting in Him alone for our salvation. It's not Jesus plus anything else. Not going to church, not tithing, not acts of service. It's giving your life to Christ. And literally hundreds of you in this room have already done that. But there may be some of you who have never planted your flag. I spent two and a half hours with a guy last week who thought he had prayed a prayer, but he didn't really understand, I think, fully what the gospel meant. God's been working on his life. And some miracles I can't have time to talk about actually transpired while we're talking in restoring him with a strange relationship with his daughter. Now, what does this mean when you trust Jesus alone? It doesn't mean your problems are going to go away. It doesn't mean that life will get great. 
It doesn't mean you're going to win the lottery. It does mean that you're saying, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior, the Savior of the world that we just read about. And so what are you going to choose today? Would you bow your heads? And if you've never trusted Christ with your life, would you repeat silently in your mind and in your heart these words? Dear Jesus, I know I need you. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. And so I accept the free gift of eternal life. And I'm trusting alone in Jesus, in you, Lord, for my salvation. I know that you died for me, and I accept that. And so as you look up at me, if you prayed that prayer, you're not going to have to come forward. I just want you to look at me and say, yeah, I prayed that prayer for the very first time. Okay, 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 okay. Just look, look me, I can't see. All right, right there, very good. Over there, back there, and I can't see in the back. So if you are in the back, just kind of put your hand up. Okay. Would you talk to me? Would you talk to Monica? Would you talk to John? Would you talk to Rick? Would you talk to Kim, to Josh, to Amber? any of us and the elders we'd love to talk to you more about your next steps thank you dear jesus amen